All right. Well, good morning, guys and gals. Uh, for those in the, in the crowd, uh, I'm sure we'll have more joining us. Uh, we had a good registration for this one. I think it's a topic that that most people uh, are passionate about these days, uh, and we'll we'll let Tyler get into that. But I want to welcome you to this month's Learn webinar presented to you by Landscape Supply, Ten Bard Seed, and Walker Supply. My name is Eric Snellsire. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing for Landscape Supply Division. Our parent company, WS Conley, uh, supports our three divisions here, as well as a few others, uh, all in the kind of the landscape and erosion control business as well. And uh, so pleased to be here and be your moderator today um, with a longtime friend of mine, a longtime friend of this industry, Tyler Bloom. So Tyler, thank you for joining us today. Uh, looking forward to to your presentation. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for everybody to have me on. And I'm sure uh, you've had some more um, dynamic speakers than me. So I'll try not to put everybody to, <laughs> put everybody yeah, no. to sleep here. No, no, don't, don't cut yourself short. So, you know, today Tyler will present workforce development and recruiting strategies, a topic that certainly is front and center in most of uh, our industry whether you're in lawn care, sports turf, or the golf industry. Um, and frankly, outside of the, our industry, it's a, a challenge as well. So uh, Tyler started a business a few years ago, and I'll let him expand into that. Uh, before we begin, I just want to touch on a few comments um, and some housekeeping. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. I wanted to make sure everyone knew that. Uh, it will be posted on in the next week or two on our website, uh, on the on-demand section of those. You'll also be able to get a link set out to this recording. Uh, probably in the next few days, I'll send it out to everybody that registered um, so that they have it in case they missed today or want to share it with other people amongst their operations or general managers or owners. So um, we also want to encourage your participation. If you look on your screen, you should have a raise hand function available to you to ask questions that way. Uh, I can unmute you if you raise your hand. The second way is the chat function. Uh, you can type your questions into chat. We'll uh, address those chats uh, or questions, excuse me, as they come up throughout the presentation. Uh, we've got lots of time here, so plenty of time for your participation. Uh, as many of you guys know, these learn webinars and supporting continuing education are important core values to our company and our team members. First and foremost, I wanna thank you guys for your participation. Uh, at the as a reminder, at the end of this presentation, uh, Tyler will uh, show a slide that has a QR code for, for future registration for other webinars being offered. And uh, I think we have two more in our spring webinar series, and then we're gonna take a break, I think in July, uh, possibly, uh, bring it back up in September for a fall series. So keep your eye out on that on social media and, and email blasts that we'll send out. Uh, but we've got two more topics for the spring webinar series coming up and he'll show you the QR code on how to get registered for those topics if you're interested. You know, our company, WS Conley Landscape Supply is owned, is family owned. It prides itself on being in tune with our customers' needs and our challenges. And, and frankly, our motto is to be big enough to serve and small enough to care. And so today's webinar is just one small way that we, you know, we hope to serve you guys and gals in this industry. Uh, certainly love feedback from you and uh, encourage you guys to continue to participate in these and give us feedback on topics that maybe you want to see in the future. So uh, without any further ado, I want to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Tyler Bloom, Tyler Bloom Consulting. Uh, Tyler has an executive certificate in talent acquisition from Cornell University. He also has a bachelor's in science from Penn State. Uh, we are. And then, uh, and then all, obviously 19 plus years of working in this industry. So as a superintendent, assistant superintendent at a number of clubs, I think your last stint was at Sparrows Point in Baltimore. So since 2020, Tyler's been, has placed over 100 professionals, and I'll let him kind of expand on that. He's been extremely busy. Uh, I'm happy for you, Tyler, to take, you know, the risk that you took to take this business and, and jump all in, and you've done a wonderful job. So I'm going to 
up my my uh, camera. It's your show, man. Congratulations. And and by the way, I wanted to say happy birthday. I know it's your birthday today. So what a better way to spend your birthday than one up with us, right? So that's, thank that's, you. That's exactly it. We couldn't have uh, painted this any better. So we'll appreciate uh, that introduction and uh, everyone that's that's here for this webinar. Hopefully you'll be able to take away some practical things. Uh, probably going to be interjecting some thoughts that you've never really considered before. And uh, like Eric said, I've been in the golf industry for 20 plus years, started playing golf when I was six years old and have just really formed a passion for talent development, talent acquisition, and uh, just feel like I'm in a really special spot for myself and my career and getting to work with so many really awesome employers, um, different, different pathway than I envisioned. Um, but it's been it's been a fun ride and I've learned a lot and I'm, I'm really grateful for a lot of the relationships that we've had and some of those relationships people are here today. So um, I, I really hope that people will put some questions that you have pointed questions in the chat. This, this presentation really is overarching of two years, three years being in this and it evolves, you know, things that I've learned two, three years ago, not that they're not applicable now, but having worked with employers and kind of being in the trenches, there's some things and insights, trends that I see that can be helpful and hopefully applicable in your current situation. But, you know, many times, whether it's a webinar like this, engaging with a business, whether that's landscape, sports field, golf courses, a lot of times these sort of questions or comments come up and, and what people are looking for um, as it, as it relates to their team and labor. So most people, and I'll raise my hand at times are very frustrated with the state of labor. I mean, here, my role, primarily our business is helping businesses recruit search and placement. And we get frustrated with interview processes, candidates flaking out, no call, no show candidates that go into jobs and, and you get all the great references You've done all the vetting possible and they get on site and something doesn't work out. So I'm here to tell everybody that's in on this webinar is you're not alone. I don't think it's changing anytime soon. Um, so a lot of what I find is just having, having a mindset that you're going to do everything you can to focus on what you can control. And, and unfortunately, in this day and age of labor, not just this industry, it's just there's no there's no linear solution. It's really complex. Um, so we'll, we'll highlight some of those things and trends that we see and give you some educational material, hopefully some funny stories. But uh, I'll start off with this, this good story to give some perspective. We were working with a, uh, a, a very top level private facility in the New England territory a little over a year ago for an, an equipment manager search, high level position compensation was between, I believe, 100 to 125,000. And we had a candidate who came recommended to us and had great references, great track, great career credentials. And I'm sitting, getting prepared for a Zoom interview Friday, Friday morning. Superintendent is a, is a type A uh, personality. So he's very high strong. He's in a high pressure situation. And the individual that we were about to interview, we recognized was under the influence of something. And it was a really awkward conversation. And I sat there and thought, geez, I'm getting compensated to help bring good talent to the table. And a candidate we're presenting, we can clearly tell is under some, some level of influence. And I share that story, you know, very vulnerably is just to say, like, no matter what you do, we've done from background checks, vetting of candidates, and getting information about somebody, there's things that sometimes play out that you have no control over. So I, I, I start this conversation off with that story um, because I'm sure everybody in this room has had one of those doozies and uh, you kind of think, geez, could it get any worse? Well, you'll remember this and say, well, at least I wasn't Tyler Bloom presenting a, a candidate that you know clearly had some, some challenges. But as an overarch overview summary, these are what I see is a state of the workforce, whether that's at the entry level position, um, even all the way up to the executive level role. And every employer is dealing with rising entry wages, 
which is creating wage compression throughout their teams, meaning you may have some people on staff that have been there for multiple years, and now their their pay is being kind of compromised because of the rising entrance wages, and it's put a lot of pressure on businesses as how to adapt. And unfortunately, um, at least in the, let's call it the golf community world, it's hard for for clubs and, and organizations to make those kind of adjustments as quickly as what those wage increases look like and the demand from, from the market. Um, and, and so there's no bulletproof solution on, on how do you deal with it? It's every, every club, every business is having to adjust on the fly. Now it seems that most businesses have sort of reset and those that didn't are, are still dealing with that aspect of wages and, and how that's contributing to overall, overall, um, how that's impacting their operations. The one of the biggest things we clearly hear just because we're working with so many facilities on assistant management placements is just the lack of educated and industry trained workers. And from our perspective, that that issue really kind of stemmed from years of, of students not getting into the industry for one reason or the other, whether that's because of wages, whether that's because of work-life balance, whatever you want to call it, that bottleneck at the at the university level is contributing to why there's such a shortage in assistant superintendents. And, you know, you can you can read as many articles as you want about that issue, but it's front and center and it's it's not going away, I don't think, anytime soon, at least not in the next two to three years. But there's some solutions to that, not always the quickest method, but um and then as you can see, some of these other trickle down effects. So Clearly, without as many people on staff, people are being stretched in their positions to do more with less. And so that obviously creates other uh, down the road downstream effects like employee burnout. So, um, you know, certainly would love to get any feedback that you have on things that you've dealt with kind of overall state of the workforce. Well, you know, I kind of circled back to what happened in the pandemic. Um, and time frame is just that overall, what we kind of explained as rising entrance wages is that in the trades industry and hospitality industry, the wages kind of seen what we saw and what's been documented, whether it's through the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics at the Department of Labor, is that there was about a 17% increase in entrance wages. So how does an industry that in many cases was already behind the curve on, on wages how does it adjust and adapt to that kind of increase? It's really hard to. And, and even in the landscape world, having worked with a number of landscape businesses, you know, making those adjustments, whether it's on the services they provide, the cost of services, it's not something that could change that quickly to adapt to that demand from the employment world. So, you know, I, again, I think many facilities that we've worked with hit a reset 21, 22, but for most businesses, they just... They just couldn't do that because they would lose customers. They would lose some of the things that kind of got them to where they are. So um, unfortunately for, for many of those facilities, they're still being hamstrung a little bit by not having enough staff, having staff that are leaving for, you know, marginal pay increases. And, and, and unfortunately, that's just some of the downstream effects. So what I, I know I kind of just highlighted some of the overarching themes and Clearly, we'll we'll talk about a little bit more in depth on some of those compensation trends and things like that. But really what I want to focus on, you know, in the next hour is kind of these four key areas. And I start with self-discovery because it always seems to me when we engage with employers, no matter what, still people are operating with this mentality that employers have the leverage and employers can still do things like they did 5 10 15 years ago and and they're not getting in, they're not improving because they haven't changed they haven't adapted with the times so i'm going to give you some exercises hopefully that you can take back we won't spend too too much time and and obviously try to provide some educational for you so you have information that you can take back to decision makers at your facilities whether that be club managers owners Maybe even you're the owner and you need to be educated on, on your business function. So we'll give you some of that information. Uh, clearly some recruiting methods and, and some development techniques. So we'll, we'll go over that. Um, and I have found this comment 
to be really consistent in a lot of areas of business right now, not solely focused on this industry, but really the core issue I find in most situations is fractures in leadership. And in many cases, when employers are coming to us because they're not having success retain, retaining people and they're not having success um, with recruiting individuals, a lot of times I can point back to some leadership fractures and I'll raise my hand and tell you that was me as well as a superintendent. You know, so I'm not going to sit here and be hypocritical and preach to the choir, but I was really that individual who maybe didn't take ownership in creating a workplace culture that people wanted to be a part of. Maybe I was that person that didn't listen to my staff and try to take some advice from them and really engage them into our operations. And a lot of times when we speak with candidates, the feedback we get when we ask them, why are you leaving your current employer and exploring different opportunities? Many times it's pointed back that they don't feel they're a part of the overall team culture they don't feel that their employers invested into them and so that's not a direct shot necessarily at the at the at the leader itself but it takes leadership to be able to overcome that and try to educate and build that workplace culture over time but i share that information because it's consistent with what we hear with many situations why candidates are leaving jobs because they don't feel they have the right culture in place where they're at for them to grow and develop so really place an emphasis on your impact of, of your employees, whether that's to your assistant managers, or even if you're an assistant manager, what your influence and impact is on recruitment and how you can help build that culture yourself. Shouldn't always fall on the superintendent, the sports head sports field manager. It really needs to be delegated and, and kind of infiltrated throughout the team is that leadership component. So, you know, I, I kind of always hear similar themes um, when I talk to teams as to why the position's open, what kind of staff are they looking to kind of recruit, what are some of the issues they deal with internally? So I'm sure some of these comments or notes that I put here resonate with, with people here. All right, we'll make sure you're going to have the slides so, that, so you'll get to see some of this information afterwards, but... You know, a lot of times clubs will ask me, man, what are, what are the what are the places that are having success? What are they doing? And and I kind of look at some of these key themes is they're very value based organizations. They have really concrete goals, a purpose, mission, and vision of who they are as a business, what kind of em employment structure and and employee development that they have to offer at their facility, they're very clear on that. And they're able to communicate that consistently to their existing employees and to potentially any new recruits. Um, and they, and I would say one of the biggest underlying thing is the camaraderie within the team. Uh, I always make this joke that a lot of times I'll, I'll go to, I'm gonna say a mid-level to public level facility. And, and a lot of times the vibe in that break room and within that team is really high and the morale is really good because there's just that camaraderie and, and family oriented perspective within the team. And I think sometimes that's missing at other facilities because we get so focused on the job for all well-intended purposes. Um, you know, it seems that some of the level, higher level facilities, they're higher expectation producing results, that expectation is not changing, but sometimes that can be lost as that camaraderie side of it. So that is consistent with top performing organizations where whomever we worked with is that the key piece and and really being value driven so how do you get that from your employees or how do you build that if you're starting from scratch it starts with just basic feedback you know taking the time in your workday to engage with your staff and ask them what are the most critical things that they look for in an employer what they value working at your institution or your organization and making sure that you follow through on those things and don't leave that up the chance. Some facilities do a great job of 
posting pictures, putting their values on a board, but they may not actually act upon that. And it just kind of looks good on the surface. Great organizations really are following through on those values that their employees have kind of distinguished to them of what's important. And from a leadership individual perspective, there's a lot of tools that you can use at your disposal that really don't cost you anything to, to do if you don't have an idea of what those values are, what your leadership style is and communication style. And here's just a list of them that we've used or I've used in my time coming up through the through the ranks. So um, we'll just highlight that for you. I know it's April, end of April and kind of May, the growing season's here. But don't leave it up to chance, and, and I would absolutely explore utilizing some of these personality assessment tools or value statement tools um, to really help you and your team really establish the kind of culture you currently have and maybe also distinguish what you want to become. So I am a partner with the Predictive Index. I'm certainly not going to you know, sit here and tell you that, hey, you need to absolutely be a PI subscriber. They're great tools to use. Um, and, and sort of these self-discovery phases, um, like I said, either for you as an individual or as a team, but, um, I think there's resources out there to help you if you've never participated in an exercise like that yourself. Okay. I hear this a lot and I like to use this quote about leading by example and what, and what really is that? And, and it's mostly about who you are as a person. It's really about those values it's about how you treat people, how you respond to conflict, how you respond to tough times, given even this circumstance with labor. Um, and, and it's hard, I think, as, as the leader of an organization, at times you, you kind of wish you had a break yourself and people would pick you up. But, you know, this is something that was taught to me years ago is when you're in that lead spot, no one's going to have more passion than you do. And they shouldn't have more passion than you do overseeing your operations. Um, so hopefully this kind of maybe gives a different mindset about leadership and lead by example. Um, it's not about the, the, the X's and O's it's about how you treat people and how you interact and engage with people, um, within your teams. And I think that that's important. And we see that come through, uh, time and time again. So I see Kevin, you've got your hand raised. Feel free to comment. Maybe that's Eric jumping in. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's Eric. Sorry. Um, I have a question for you, Tyler, because as I kind of reminisce back into my days as a manager with in the golf community, there's sometimes that challenge of communication barrier with language, right? Like uh, in my case, I had a mostly Hispanic staff and their core values were, were somewhat different than what we had, uh, you know, in some cases. Um, can, can you kind of Talk about that because I, I don't know how many guys are dealing with, you know, maybe cultural differences amongst their staff, whether it's, you know, foreign country employers, J1s, H2Bs, you know, can you, can you touch on the, that challenge? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the language barrier, you know, is certainly something that I think many of us have dealt with at some point in our careers and something that I see at employers that do have kind of that multicultural base and, and again, this might sound so simple. There's nothing earth shattering about this, but like lunchtime is such a critical component for that, for the Hispanic community and the Latino community. And I have found that supervisors and assistant managers that engage in those kind of conversations in that time really build those relationships with those team members. And, and again, that's not a whole lot of effort. That's just saying, hey, at lunchtime, periodically, we're going to make sure we jump in there, break bread have some just basic communication. And I find that to be a very simple tactic that, you know, doesn't take a lot of effort and time, but, you know, in terms of pulling what's important from them, again, I find I had a conversation this morning with an individual who's multi, you know, speaks multi-language and is kind of that mediator between the white community, you know, the, the American community and the Latino community. And, and I'd asked that person, how do you, how do you engage with both parties to get the same, to get the end result that both want? And a lot of times it's just from their perspective was just making the time to understand and taking that feedback and acting on it, not saying you're going to act on it and three, four months later go by and nothing happens. It's being persistent with it and being consistent with it as well. Uh, 
thoughts on that? Any other feedback? Yeah, that's great. All right. I'm going to share. One second. Sometimes, too, I was out in Northern California back in, I think it was February, for the, an assistance boot camp. And it was the first time I've been to any industry event where the majority of people were not white males. They had females, they had Latinos. And, uh, you know, I had asked some of the superintendents and that were in attendance, like, how did that, how did this come about? Because there's nowhere else I've seen this. And, and they just said, but basically they were, I hate to say it this way, but they were forced because they had no other option. And they said, what they've learned though, is that for, for so many years, they had this barrier, this guard that they couldn't teach a Latino individual how to spray, how to hand water. And what they found was that those individuals were extremely good with the staff and team development. And they were able, because they kind of were, for, you know, forced into the situation to have to train those individuals, it ended up being the best thing because then other individuals on the team saw that elevation of that Latino person ahead of a white male that it inspired others to want to do the same thing. Right. So I often wonder in some of these metro markets, whether it's Long Island, DC, Baltimore, Philadelphia, it, especially in the Florida market, um, if that's the same, if that would be the same method. And I would tell you, I've heard more, more recently from superintendents on the East Coast that are now starting to train their Latino workers, um, primarily Spanish speaking employees to do some of those more technical things, um, clearly because they just don't have that, they don't have that labor source. So I want to skip through this and just kind of give you like my overall, like, personal strategic plan everybody in here should be setting you know personal goals for yourself and how you can improve your leadership and i would just say to, to everybody here make it a point that you're going to write down two leadership skills that you can focus on the next 90 days whether that's relationship management with your peers whether that's communication whether that's team building exercises like write it down and share it with somebody don't just leave it up here because you won't you won't take action and then the other thing I would say is really think about those core values individually for yourself and for your team. And I think it's a great exercise to go through, not just to say you went through it, but really to build camaraderie and build build that sort of trust and rapport. Um, and sometimes we put those guards up that we're, we can't talk about those things. You know, we need to put our head down and just get the work to some degrees. But I really have found that leaders who are, are participating and engaging with their staff on those kind of discussions are having a lot more success in the retention side of things, let alone the recruiting side, um, because there's more of a personal relationship. So any, any questions from that before I kind of move into more of a, you know, an educational piece? Okay. So as I'm sure most people joined in here is to get some educational feedback in terms of what's being offered and salaries and all those things. And what are some trends? So this was a slide that uh, one of my good friends at the PGA career services, uh, Jonathan Gold had shared at a Metro uh, education event. I think it was two winters ago. And it just showed the cost of living in the metropolitan area of New York. And I'm sure there's some various similarities and comparisons to what we would see in the D.C., Baltimore, Northern Virginia markets. Um, you know, but when you really lay out the general cost of living for somebody and you start to think of the wages that are being offered in this industry, um, whether that's at entry level or the assistant manager level, you know, I really kind of question, like, are we really being competitive to offer somebody a livable standard wage? And uh, I think a lot of clubs have done a great job educating their boards, educating their general managers and managing up sideways, all of that to try to improve upon those wage scales. But we have a lot of work to be done. Um, fortunately for me, I guess, as I'm now in the line of fire, getting to work with different general managers and, and club leadership. And, and I think there really is an emphasis on this concept of trying to get out of the stone ages a little bit on wages but again it is it is tough when you know I can look back 10 15 years ago for myself with a four-year degree making 12 dollars an hour out, out of college 
and sometimes that's hard for a lot of people to really resonate um, and, and accept when they start looking at what they're offering their current employees. And I think that's unfortunately a barrier that people are gonna have to get over because it's changing pretty quick. I mean, we're seeing it in all the markets. It takes one club, it takes one club to make that change on salaries and then the rest follow because they have no choice. It doesn't make it right. It just is what it is to survive. And I can't tell you how many times we've been engaged on a search and we feel like we're we're making really good headway with candidates. And then a club five, 10 miles down the street offers five to $10,000 more, totally cannibalizes that search process. Can't blame the candidates. You know, it's a it's a candidate market right now for them. They're in a great spot, but um, it really, it keeps a lot of people vulnerable. But kind of coming back to this, you kind of look at what the cost of living is and, and clubs are just going to have to continue to be educated on this component. It seems at times people forget two, three years ago, what happened in the pandemic it's, and, and this is going to keep happening again until they feel the pain of not filling positions. They're going to change because they have no choice to. Um, we certainly don't go into situations and advocate, hey, we need to spend 30% more, 20% more. What we try to do is benchmark other comparative clubs and or businesses that they would be competing against uh, to help just educate people. So these are what we would see across the line, across the US as kind of the trend in compensation. And I know this is really focused on probably golf course superintendents and, and, the, and the sports field kind of communities. But I think if you're in landscaping, you could probably look at some of these more senior level positions and this would resonate with, because it's what I'm seeing working with landscape companies, what it's going to take to get more senior level qualified people. And again, this is our own data. This is not GCSA certified. This is not SFMA certified. This is not club manager approved. This is just what we see in the trends of compensation across the U.S. And I think what makes it difficult for, for so many people is that, you know, I look at the line staff number three years ago, it probably was more of 10 to $15 an hour. And within three years, it shot up, you know, to that number. And it gets really tricky as you keep moving up the ranks that those individuals that have been there in a foreman type role, maybe experienced staff member for eight to 10 years, they were probably making 17, 18, $19 an hour. So those adjustments across the board have been really challenging for, for a lot of employers um, to, to manage. And again, my expertise is not how to necessarily drive that revenue or drive that stream to accommodate these wages. I'm just kind of sharing what, what we see consistently across the board. I've had a lot of comments about, um, you know, looking at senior level assistants, individuals with two-year, four-year degrees, maybe six, seven, eight, nine years worth of experience, and a lot of deliberation on, are we are we shortchanging those individuals because they may get comfortable in a position because now they're making 90 to $100,000 and they may not take that leap of faith into a leadership type role. And I totally understand the uh, philosophy behind that. I think every facility is going to handle it individually. And, but ultimately I come back to, well, in many situations, your current employer might be a better opportunity for that somebody versus going into a situation that, yeah, they may make another 10, 15, $20,000, but they may not have the resources to be successful in that role. And so a lot of times I am now coaching employers to say, I think you should look at bumping your wages up so you don't lose those people and you can retain them. You're helping that person long-term. Maybe it stunts a little bit of the growth and development of your lower tier managers for a little bit, but ultimately you're, you're taking care of your facility and organization. And that's, that's not always the philosophy of every superintendent. Um, and listen, there's, there's some really strong repu reputable clubs that can push people through every two, three, four years. Most employers are unfortunately not like that. So I know talking with managers in all different scopes across the, the country, 
I see more of this philosophy of retaining those key senior level assistants because there's just not a lot of newer people getting into the industry. So just some thoughts and comments on that. You may be at a place where you say, where do I get this information from? Like Tyler, that's all great, but we'd like to get some more concrete evidence. Um, here are just some examples that you can leverage for, for your dispo, you know, disposal. Uh, club benchmarking, I think, does a great job in, in gathering data from all different levels of clubs and, and be able to point out here's where we think, you know, based on your parameters and your and your operations, what you what you should be paying people or what competitive clubs are offering. Clearly, the GCSA does their compensation study. Um, we've participated in local chapter surveys and compensation studies. So, you know, maybe that that's a conversation for another day um, to get your local chapters to participate in a in a very regional specific uh, compensation study. And then a lastly thing I would say is hit your career centers. If you go on careeronestop.org, you can sign up for a free employer account. And in many of those, whether it's Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, wherever you're coming from, those state institutions or websites have local compensation data that you can share with your key stakeholders, what the landscaping industry is offering, what building and grounds maintenance employees are being offered. So you have not just your own sector of the industry, but also competing sectors in the grant, groundskeeping, landscaping, maintenance world. So you can validate why you need to pay those, those increased wages. And again, we're, it's, it's April 5th, April 20th or April 13th. Grass is growing. Applications are important. This is probably not stuff that you can dive too deep in on, but this is, again, a strategy or an exercise that I would encourage every employer to do. And if you're the lead person and you don't have the time, delegate it to an assistant manager because they're going to need that information at some point in their career and how to go through this exercise of showing a, a, a compensation comparison. And I apologize, my screen is a little bit fuzzy on this slide. But um, as we talk about benefits, and, and again, same thing, we get a lot of questions um, you know, across the board of, well, outside of direct cash, what are other things that, that employers are doing? And this gives you a pretty broad reach of all the different types of rewards and benefits that, that employers are offering. Not necessarily all of the above, but at least a la carte that here and there, they're, they're starting to piece together um, a mix of direct benefits, blended benefits, and experiential benefits. So um, I could highlight maybe one or two that I think is becoming more common practice. One would be housing, whether that's offering on-site facilities, dormitory-style facilities, apartment complexes off-site, or in many cases, now I find employers are offering housing stipends uh, to, to employees to just maybe overcome some of that direct compensation, uh, the lack thereof, if, if you want to call it that. The other one I would say is tuition reimbursement, and, and not necessarily in the form of scholarship money, but literally helping employees either pay for their education as they're on the job or senior level managers that are paying back student loans, those cl clubs and facilities and organizations are contributing to that as a whole. So those two seem to be very uh, consistent in a lot of our conversations and a lot of clubs and businesses we work with, if they don't have that sort of program set up right now, they're working towards it. So I think you'll see that more commonplace uh, moving forward. So Anyways, I see a, a hand in the chat, so I'll stop there. Yeah, so um, Tyler, we've got a question here. There are many who complain on a regular basis about labor shortages, and this goes for many different industries. And then there are others that don't complain and don't seem to have issues. To me, it starts at the top nine times, nine out of 10 times, leadership is super critical in today's environment, maybe more so than ever before. Any comments to that? I, I, I think I may have a slide here later in this whole thing is the number one differentiator I find is leadership and the lack thereof. 
And that means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. But I come back to the comment I made earlier about candidates, why they're leaving is because of lack of leadership, lack of lead by example, lack of somebody going to bat for employees. And, and, and that seems there's a lot of pieces to that, that we would spend far more than an hour on, on how to become a good leader. But um, I would agree with that statement. Um, not always the case, you know, some, some cases you have certain situations where businesses are doing all the right things and they just geographically are in an area that people don't, aren't attracted to these low income wage type jobs, long hours, early mornings. It's, it's tough work. It's, it's really difficult work and it's hard to, it's hard to really quantify what that is. And that's why it places an even bigger importance on that leadership and team culture. And again, not even just at the superintendent or direct hiring manager, but down to the assistant level management. And so there needs to be some level of education. And maybe today's part of that is messaging is the assistant managers need to really take ownership of their impact on building a team. Good question or good comment. And, and here's just kind of some, again, more supporting evidence on the student loan repayment, tuition reimbursement. They kind of somewhat fall in the same category. So there, there are opportunities out there for employers to participate to get some level of uh, assistance for their employees, whether they're pursuing going to turf school or a master's program, you know, irrelevant industry education. I just think in general, employers are, are committing to this to help um, help employees out, you know, gain further education and growth development. All right. So your action from here, from this kind of section is, again, go to that careeronestop.org, sign up, register. Just take a look around at all the different resources that are available on those websites, including job advertisement. You can post jobs um, through those websites that are free to you. And most people just don't even know they exist. There's also a ton of information on there on recruiting. So if you want to connect with veterans, you want to connect with local career centers, people with disabilities, there are contact information out there that you can then share those job advertisements as well too. And again, another great, a great exercise, great thing for assistant managers, lower level managers to, to participate in. All right. We'll move into recruitment. And um, this is an area that I'm really passionate about and really enjoy. Um, and, and it's a work in progress. We're certainly not well oiled um, in our practices and our methodologies. But, you know, one of the things that uh, a mentor for me is a gentleman by the name of Armin Suni. Um, he was one time quoted in a magazine. And it was a magazine article about businesses as a whole have done a real poor job of recruiting in their communities. And I experienced this myself as a superintendent right around that same time that article came out mm -hmm. is sometimes clubs, I think for what they are, have had this, it's just the tradition, the heritage of being sophisticated institutions that they're not, they've not really been too involved in their communities or maybe haven't looked at themselves that they're really a, uh, a reflection of their local community. And so I think that because we didn't really have these labor issues and, you know, five, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have to go recruit. That's just not the way of the world anymore. Having, having a presence in your communities is going to be absolutely critical moving forward. And all these different focus areas or target audiences are part of that puzzle, whether it's high schools, uh, community colleges, chambers of commerce, workforce development representatives, all of those different target audiences exist in your community. It has more about making that connection to those audiences and then being persistent with them. I found as a superintendent, we were really fortunate that we had five public high schools within 10 minutes. That's not everywhere. I, I get that. And not everybody wants to build their teams from, from high school students because of all the stereotypical issues that most people have experienced with um, dealing with, with young, the younger generation. But I would tell you for me, and I see this consistently still today, that the organizations that are building those relationships at the high school level 
are having more success filling those, let's call entrance managerial type roles, because those people have been groomed and developed and, and matured over the course of three, four years into those type roles. Many students don't have the influences that a lot of us have. have. I mean, again, I'll look back at myself and say, I was a knucklehead. You kidding me? I, I still haven't figured things out and I'm still causing problems, right? But um, when I was young, I had no I had no clear direction. I mean, I only knew what I knew in my backyard. So getting exposure to places like a Marion Golf Club and Oakmont Country Club, it's a totally different world. And for, for many students, their first access to the private club world or any of the businesses that are here, they may not have had that sort of mentorship and, and structure that uh, you find in this industry. So I just... I know it's hard sometimes to think, man, I'm going to really try to build my team off of high school students, but I always look at the comparison of, look at the college football world. They're making a killing off of 16, 17, 18-year-old students, not as what they are right now, but what they're going to develop them to become. Um, and you can really kind of take that same methodology across all these different organizations. So, you know, I just impress upon people that there's no one clear pathway in terms of the audiences you should be recruiting, it should be all of them. And the first step really is finding out who those key contact points are within all those institutions so you can build a relationship. And, you know, here we are three years in and I've worked with some of the uh, facilities that are that are here on this call. And I kind of question myself, am I any further along than I was three years ago? And 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 yielding the results of getting more people in I, I think there's a lot to be desired there, but on the same token, we try to turn every stone we can. Um, I think an untapped market for many businesses is the idea of re-entry programs. And I find engaging with, I think it was Baltimore, I think it was the Baltimore County, uh, one of the, one of the, the re-entry programs there the first time I engaged with them, they told me they had over 50 people that, you know, were people that could do work release type programs and, I, and they had no employers willing to take them on. It's really difficult in this environment that some people are in and the restrictions they have given the sophistication of employment and, and the people they represent um, at those institutions to be able to take on a, a program like that. But I, again, I just would advocate that there's resources there to help you um, and explore some non-traditional type audiences for entry-level type work. Clearly building relationships with veterans, career and tech schools, these are all probably long-term plays, but you know, I certainly think if if you can start to interject yourself into your community, you're going to find those two or three key feeder programs to help you fill out more so that seasonal that seasonal based um, employment shortage. A lot of times, I think we we over forget there we 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 forget about the fact that our employees are going to be oftentimes our best sources for talent at any level, and. You know, one thing that I think we've, my company, and, and I've really benefited from is the referral mechanism. It's not always the first person that we engage with that leads us to a potential placement. It's it's the person or people that they know that share that opportunity with others that may be interested or may never even known the opportunity existed. So referral programs, I think, are really critical now. Then we've seen all levels of rewards, whether that's a $100 stipend, a $500 stipend, you can get super creative, but rewarding your employees for being your own champion. And, and I think that's something that clubs that are and businesses that are instituting that are finding a lot of success um, each year. And again, that mechanism kind of continues to feed itself year after year. But these are some of the other you know, strategies that you can think about in terms of recruiting and where to post jobs and who to consider? Um, you know, I've I've heard this com I've heard this comment self deprecating. It's like, oh, I've got to go the Tyler Bloom method, which is you know it seems to me like a last ditch resort um, for for some employers. But yeah, I mean, when did we ever have to hire 
recruiters or firms to help fill assistant level management positions. We're in a totally different market than we've ever been. And I find that so many employers feel like it's a weakness or that they're they're lesser of an employer because they need to seek help. And it's the complete opposite. It's a strength and you're leveraging every resource you have to, to fill your rosters for seasonal full-time managerial type roles. You've got to leverage every little bit and piece that you have. So I really try to talk some people off the ledge to say it's okay to go seek help. And the good thing is there's more than Tyler Bloom out there. There's some great resources, um, whether that be temp agencies, whether that be other recruiting firms, there's a lot of different people that can help you. So, um, and, and another thing I've found really interesting is look internally in your organization. You know, so a lot of times I find, and, and I did as a superintendent, and hopefully this story will make sense. Some of our best employees actually came from the pro shop or the clubhouse. I always said we were a bunch of misfits, you know, and the grounds department can take on anybody because we'll find a place for them. We'll maximize their 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 capabilities and fit and find a role for those people to contribute. And, our, and some of our best employees came from other departments within the club that would be deemed as outcasts. Um, so, you know, that's something to really consider too, when you have conversations within your management team is, Hey, instead of firing an employee that may not be a good fit for front facing type positions, like a server, a busser, a wait, waiter, bartender, they may enjoy the environment that they're in. They just need to get repositioned into a different role and, and capacity. And that's really understanding personalities too. So just some, just some quick tips that I see. But I love kind of sharing this slide, you know, so if we take the mentality that we're always recruiting and we think about that referral mechanism and the power of three, everybody on your team knows at least three people that could help recruit for you. And if you start looking at how many positions do you really need to fill in an entire season and where can that come from, that's where building those connections internally and the relationships with your team and that culture aspect really can have a, a positive influence and a real direct business influence um, because you want those people to be your ambassadors of your culture, of the workplace, of the career opportunities. And so as you start thinking about the influence and connections that they have, social networks, you know, social media, um, personal relationships, that's why it's so important to have um, your team being those recruiters for you as well so you start thinking about that in this kind of scope you say wow it doesn't really take a whole lot to really have that kind of impact and, and where where our reach potential could be just just from an internal all right so so my kind of action steps for everybody here is just list three new sources that you can research in your area make a connection in the next 30 days share your job descriptions and and be persistent follow up with those people every 30 to 60 days. I find that a lot of times our persistence with candidates and or different contact points um, is part of our success is because we're keeping them top of mind. So just because the first time go around that you present a job opportunity to somebody and they don't accept it doesn't mean they won't be interested in 30, 60 days. Something could change in their life. They may have been busy the first time that you engaged with them in their day-to-day -day working. So just make sure to be consistent with following up. All right, my last section, I'm, I'm going to try to whiz through this pretty quick so I leave some time for Q&A. But uh, something I have found um, anecdotally, but I, I certainly would like to spend more time on research on this from my own standpoint on the employment side. But... I have found working with clubs all across the U.S. that, you know, years ago, the name and name and logo and the image of a club had more influence than anything of why candidates would go work for certain certain positions. And again, that could be at the entrance level all the way up, mostly more towards those senior level roles. And what I have found recently and and really the last three to six months of being a little bit more engaged on executive level type roles and, and, and really these senior level management roles 
is that the actual leader themselves has more influence on why candidates are interested in a position or they're not. So I like to always use this example um, from a group that I work with. It's called Brand Builders Group. They did a national study about personal brands and why people choose certain companies, choose certain products, and, and the influence that their personal brands of those companies and the people leading those companies have on decisions by individuals. And, and again, just wanted to share this little, really quick little highlight. 74% um, of people are more likely to trust someone who has an established personal brand. So if you're a hiring manager, if you're a superintendent, if you're a CEO, whatever it is, I think that it would behoove you to start thinking about how you can put your face in front of more people and talk about why coming to work for you, your organization is going to help elevate somebody else. That's what I find most candidates are looking for today. They want a personal connection. They want to like, trust, respect you as the person, not as much influenced by the logo. And, and I can say that really concretely because we've worked with facilities that have less reputational credibility than some a top 100 level facility and they're having a better uh they're having better success in the recruitment and retention world because of that leader himself or herself and and I know it's a really different topic it's a very different concept we've never had to really think about personal branding from a, from a recruiting standpoint, but I find that employers that are really putting themselves out there and they're connecting at the university level, they're spending time on blogs, podcasts, presentations at whether it's regional, local chapter meetings in their communities are having more success because they're putting themselves out there and there's a personal connection with, with candidates. And there's so many great examples of people that do that um, in our region and locally, nationally, but things as simple as a, a video highlight of pictures of your workplace facility can, can make an impact on an individual. Having a Twitter account with your personal photo, professional photo, and talking about all the great things you're doing day to day in your operations it's building a story about what you value and it's it's on public display now there's certainly a lot of clubs um that would uh you know that, that this was taboo there's no way they were going to put their information out but even to the highest degree look at what augusta national has been doing over the last few weeks leading into the masters there's never a club that you would think would ever have to do something like that because of their brand image and likeness at Augusta National. It's not that way anymore. So I just encourage you all to kind of think about that in a different context that if you don't think you can because of time, you don't think you can because of privacy issues that with your club, your competition is, and there are, in, in many cases, they're already ahead of it. And it's going to become more and more normal practice. So that's some creativity things that I think a lot of us can take away from today and say, hey, how could we build a, a LinkedIn profile account? How can I build Twitter? How can I build some of these things to be more front facing? Because that's where I find a lot of our candidates are coming through is, is through social media um, and, and being able to advocate for the employers in, in a very different way. All right. From a development standpoint, you know, once you recruit them in, that's all fine and dandy, but you got to develop them. And I think this is a real, uh, it's a real heavy topic that I think, again, we could spend hours talking about, but whether you have a formalized training program or unstructured training program, putting the time and effort to advocate what that is and communicate to employees that they can grow, develop, gain further education, develop more skill cell skills skills is absolutely paramount in retaining employees because they have options to go anywhere else if they don't see a vision for them to grow in the organization they're not going they're not going to stay engaged so 
you know, I always give this example of Adam uh, Naravancheck, who's now the superintendent at Sparrows Point. Adam started with me as a high school student, had no care in the world or professional direction. I think leadership and and uh, core values were were not in his vocabulary back in 2014. Adam was more focused on video games, skateboarding, and things of that nature. But because we invested time into building that workplace culture that I was so far removed from when I started there. I was terrible. I was the I was the epitome uh, was the the opposite of leadership in my role. And uh, you know, by just investing in him and and having those conversations that we talked about, getting him engaged with online training programs like Penn State, and there's other programs. I'm not advocating for one. Getting him involved in webinars like this it sparked interest. And then Adam became sort of that benchmark for the remainder of our staff of all different backgrounds, not just young students. So as, as many of you know that I've worked with and, and maybe know me a little bit, I'm a very big supporter of this idea of apprenticeship, whether it's a formalized program, you know, registered through the Department of Labor or it's not. But having some level of on the job training for your employees is going to be more and more important, uh, given that the universities just aren't pumping out uh, turf educated individuals. I came from that traditional pathway on the right, where you had multiple internships, and then you elevated yourself into a postgraduate or assistant role. And, and I'm telling you, it's, it's not changing now, it's getting worse, that employers aren't able to secure those kind of candidates. So they have to learn how to develop from within and in some cases, putting people in positions that you didn't think that they could actually perform, they'll surprise you. I think some of our best placements, you know, over the last two years have been coming from those untraditional type candidates because they're bringing different skill sets, different perspectives. Um, to some degree, I like to say this, they're not jaded by some of the previous industry norms. They don't know anything different. So it's a really fresh opportunity to mold and model people um, into the employees that you want them to become. But it does take persistence. It does take, uh, you know, consistent engagement with those individuals and and to not just say it, but actually act upon it. Um, and I think that those are really, you know, two key pieces in this whole labor aspect is how are you developing employees and how are you recruiting them and getting in front of people to kind of tell your story? So um, I'm just going to kind of breeze through here quick, but my, my my lasting message for everybody is all of these things are not going to happen overnight. It's no possible way, but you, you have to start putting together strategic plans for your team, just like you would your agronomic calendars, just like you would any of your plant protecting calendars. All of those things are equally important, but if you don't have people to do it, it's it, none of that stuff really matters. But it's not going to happen overnight. So you got to take small chunks. And, and hopefully today we've kind of given you some different things to think about from the recruiting, from marketing, um, development. And, and like I said, be happy to answer any specific questions anybody has. But um, I just think, uh, you know, my kind of closing thoughts are is if, if you want to have exponential growth in your earnings as a business, You've got to you've got to invest time in into growing your learnings and doing things like today are going to help set set that. Don't just walk away from today and say, "Well, I learned it all and I'm good to go." It's going to consistently evolve, and you need to educate those people who you're reporting to because they don't understand necessarily all the inner workings of what's going on in the workforce. So, I uh, this is my contact information. And would be happy to take any questions or feedback. And I know there's, like I said, there's a ton of more topics we could cover, but hopefully this is a, a good start for everybody and get some inspired.